Fantastic, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed panelists and honored guests. Welcome to this fascinating discussion on AI and business. Now before we delve into the depths of artificial intelligence, let me lighten the mood with a little joke. Why did the AI go on a diet? Because it had too many bites. So, but um bum. So when I started prepping for this panel, I thought, okay, I've got to open with something generated by ChatGPT. So that was the best joke that I could get ChatGPT to generate to introduce a panel on AI and business. So you're welcome or I'm sorry, depending on what you thought of that one. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kevin Dahl, and I'm one of the directors for Plug and Play here in Alberta. Uh, I specifically lead our artificial intelligence and machine learning program that's based here in the province. Um, for those of you who don't know Plug and Play, Plug and Play is one of the world's largest corporate open, open innovation accelerators. So we work at that crossroads between startups and established businesses, helping to supercharge corporate innovation by connecting them with startups from around the world that can solve their biggest challenges. Uh, so we're really excited to be here today, and I'm really excited to be here today, because that's what we've got going on on this panel. Uh, we have two corporate companies, uh, and we have two startups that are going to be here to talk a little bit about uh, AI in business and how that is uh, revolutionizing, disrupting, changing, whatever words you want to use, how it's impacting business. Um, and within the group here, before I let them introduce themselves, um, we have two companies that come from the health space. So we're going to dive in a little bit more and talk about some of the uh, most relevant and, and engaging uh, applications of AI in the health space. We have one company that is focused in travel, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how AI is, is influencing and impacting the travel industry. Um, and then we have one company that's a bit of an agnostic player that works in a bunch of different industries. Uh, so we'll have them talk a little bit about what they're seeing in travel and health, but also some of the other uh, relevant industries here as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our panel to introduce themselves. And why don't we jump all the way down to the end, and we'll start with you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, Kelly Chertichan, founder CEO at Chata.ai. Um, as Kevin was mentioning, we're, we're quite uh, industry agnostic, and really what we do at the core, you can think of it like uh, Google Translate, except instead of translating human to human language, we translate human to database query language, whether that's SQL, MongoQL, you name a lot of the different ones, but the core focus is around uh, proprietary databases and proprietary data warehouses where you can't just kind of plug in a pre-trained model to work. Uh, there's too much uniqueness there. So we really focus a lot of the generative AI technologies on uh, high quality synthetic training data, uh, which then allows the model to properly learn and converge, ultimately empowering your non-technical business user uh, to get the information that they need. Uh, but not very high level questions. I'm talking really in depth, uh, you know, many conditions, the things that pop into their inner monologue that they have to know uh, on demand and don't have to wait for that particular information. So um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's us. And Kelly, how long have you been working in this sort of AI space? Uh, well, so I was a co-founder of Circle Cardiovascular Imaging. Uh, that was back in 2008, where we were using, uh, we started using convolutional neural nets actually in 2009, uh, for those who've been around for a long time. Um, and we used that to segment cardiovascular MRI, CT images, quantify everything else. Uh, and then Chata got going in about 2017, 2018, to focus on these natural language to database interfaces. So a lot, a lot of different parts, I, I guess, of the AI landscape. Uh, you know, computer vision and, and NLP are, are huge things with numerous tasks in them, as everybody knows. So just tried to focus on a couple key tasks, but been doing it for a long time. Fantastic. So you've seen some things. Seen some things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kim, over to you. Is this on? Ooh, fancy. Yeah, hi, I'm Kim. I'm the manager of the wonderful data science and AI team at WestJet. Um, we are obviously a Canadian airline, and as you can imagine, there is a whole bunch of problems at all airlines <laughs> that AI and machine learning can help with, and that's really what our team tries to do. So we're 
really focused on helping the business be better at what it does. So whether that's our operations team and delivering them the information they need to make the best decision at the time, our pricing or revenue management team to help them figure out when we should be releasing different fares or different inventory, even our guest experience team when we're looking at evaluating all the different comments that come in in our surveys and what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, what we might need to focus on to improve at the different airports that we serve. So lots of very interesting problems and I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about them throughout this panel. I come from an academic background. So before I joined WestJet about a year ago, I was at the University of Saskatchewan working in ag tech. So I say it was doing very similar problems, but instead of watching planes fly, I was out in a farmer's field flying drones, trying to figure out how can we count bugs <laughs> that are in crops and, and figure out if they're going to be impacting um, the farmer's yields or different things like that. So I have my PhD in computer science from Canada and I kind of have traveled down that academic space for about the last 13 years and then over the last year transitioned into industry to get some more um, impactful stuff going. I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> we can talk more about that later if you want. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's jump over to Justin. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Mallet. I'm a health system partner for Roche Pharma Canada. Uh, Roche is a global uh, health system healthcare company uh, with a pharmaceutical side, so drug delivery, uh, but also a diagnostic side. So we're also building machines and uh, diagnostic tests. Um, which uh, allows us to be one of the top uh, healthcare companies in the world. Uh, I've been with Roche for about almost two years now. Um, myself, I'm a health system partner, so I'm part of the access division. Uh, as you would imagine, a healthcare company is a very intricate uh, beast. Uh, there's, of course, all the R&D that's happening to develop uh, the product, but there's also, uh, with the local affiliates, uh, there, I'm part of the team in Canada, making sure that our products are being uh, delivered to patients and uh, to, uh, to the public. Uh, um, and that's in itself is very intricate. Um, my focus is uh, on AI and digital health for uh, the entire country. So trying to push that conversation as to where can our industry evolve in not just uh, delivering small molecules or diagnostic tests, but very uh, holistic uh, healthcare solution that uh, encompasses um, computational technology. I myself uh, am trained uh, molecular biologist, ooh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I've, uh, as soon as I've uh, stepped out of academia into the industry, I've been in the industry, or in and out of the industry for about five, six years now, um, I've always been uh, d drawn and entangled in that conversation about um, where the healthcare uh, industry and sector needs to move and uh, how data and better data management is going to help the healthcare crisis. So hopefully I'm going to be able to share a little bit of um, this knowledge to, to this afternoon. We're afternoon now, right? Correct. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, and last but not least, Ken. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Kenneth Fu, I'm a co-founder and I'm currently the director for product development at Ciantra. So Ciantra is headquartered in Calgary. Um, it's a precision biotech company um, aiming to change the way cancer is uh, detected and eventually treated. Our flagship product is called the Ciantra DX um, breast cancer test. It's a molecular assay for detecting an active breast cancer signature from a blood sample. Um, so being a healthcare company, as uh, Justin is alluding to here, uh, we hold regulatory to a very high esteem. Um, and so at this point, the test is currently available to Canadian as well as US-based patients um, through the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta accreditation as well as the clinical laboratory and improvement amendments from the US. Um, we've also been successful in the CE MAC process um, and that's gonna allow us for global distribution. So how we use AI is basically um, leveraging the huge expertise um, from different industries in AI, um, and we use it to um, basically detect an active breast cancer signature through identification of unique um, patterns of expression. Um, it's actually surreal to be here today because um, 
much of Cianto's story is hinged around Amy. We started working with Amy with Ross Griner back in um, 2016. Um, and one of my very good colleagues, Nassim Asgarian, should be somewhere around. But he's a former grad student of, um, of Ross. And Ross basically handed us in good faith um, to Nassim, who's been a fantastic colleague over the years. So looking forward to some fantastic um, conversations today. Excellent, excellent. So that is our panel for today. So normally when I kick off a, a panel like this, I try to pick a topic that's really you know, exciting, invigorating, something that's gonna get people you know, leaning in, paying attention. But I feel like after talking with the panelists here in our, our prep call last week, I feel like we need to address the elephant in the room. And I think this was touched on earlier in some of the sessions this morning, but let's talk a little bit about responsibility and ethics in AI. You know, this is probably the most important topic that is being talked about today, given what's happening, whether it's chat GPT or you know, private AI being used within business. I think it's really important to kind of dive into that topic first, because that's gonna to lead to a whole bunch of interesting follow-on questions that we can discuss as a panel here as well. So with that said, you know, with such a, a rapid pace, and it, that pace is, that is only accelerating, what are your organizations doing to be very responsible and, and strategic about how you're developing your AI and ML solutions? So for this one, I'd like to start with our, our corporate panelists. So maybe uh, I'll start with you, Kim. Sure. <laughs> So when we're building AI and ML solutions, ethics is obviously a huge concern, um, and maybe not even a concern, but just a discussion point. We don't build anything, we don't start a project without talking about what potential ethical implications there might be, and what kind of data we're using, and, and the, what, could, what that could mean for what we're building. So as an airline, we have a whole bunch of regulations that we need to follow. We don't just fly in Canada, we fly all across North America and to some places in Europe and now across the other pond as well. And we have to follow rules and regulations for those governments and regulatory bodies as well. So there's usually quite a large discussion on what we're actually trying to build, what the implications would mean for all of those different bodies, who do we need to talk to, uh, potentially some discussions with our legal team to make sure that we are doing everything that we're supposed to be doing to protect data and to live up to all of the contracts and agreements that we have with the different uh, governing bodies. We build responsible AI dashboards for our machine learning models so that we can see where the biases are in those models. We can see where, what features are the most important. Are they drifting? Are they not drifting? What kinds of things are kind of going on behind the scenes of the model? We don't like to build things as a black box. We need to understand what's actually happening to that data and really be careful that we're not introducing any kind of negative biases into what we're building because we don't want those biases to be included in anybody's decision making um, and we don't want them to kind of taint anything that we're building for our business. The, ahead, there's a lot of similarities um, and this is a very loaded question, so thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, let me first say that we're in the healthcare sector heavily <clears throat> regulated. And um, whenever we're embarking on a new journey, uh, our compliance team is very powerful. And um, there's no way that we cannot ask all sorts of questions. Are, what are, what is, is what we're doing ethical? Um, we've built a uh, community of practice internally because uh, being a global organization, all of our, um, I use the umbrella term data scientists, are located in different pockets of the organization, whether it is we have different uh, R&D groups, uh, but we're also using uh, AI in our manufacturing, in our finances, in our eventually, uh, we're not, but we're thinking about our um, we're with uh, patient outreach, but um, so trying to build this, these bridges for all of these people who are thinking about uh, implementing AI within the company to share, share their knowledge, share their concerns, and uh, really hash out uh, any, any question that you might have altogether, and, um, and also reporting to uh, any compliance um, bodies that uh, they're uh, attached to. Um, we're 
we also have to think that a lot of our um, solutions when it comes to AI will probably be uh, geared toward healthcare providers and for them to use those solutions. So, um, and healthcare providers have a very strict code of uh, conduct and probably will not be uh, uh, responding very well to a black box, as you said, uh, because they're uh, accountable to their um, to the patient and to the decision that they're taking. So they, all of the caregivers that we've uh, or I have uh, encountered are not uh, willing to uh, let an AI completely decide. We're not talking about automated uh, decision, maybe more so decision support when we're talking about. Um, a tool that we're building for healthcare providers. And uh, finally, um, with, um, with C27 coming, coming up here, uh, other, uh, other regulations outside the world, it's a very good news for bigger companies because um, as Alyssa said in the prior panel, um, when you're a global organization and you have, you, you need to protect your right to play in jurisdictions, um, it's a very hard uh, decision to go in a field where there's no uh, rules. It's, you don't play a game where you don't know the rules. And that's what, um, that's what's happening throughout the world. Canada has a very, every, US, uh, EU, and Canada have different uh, strategies. Time will only tell who has the best. Uh, the Canadian one is, is really uh, peculiar because we will probably by the end of the year, or early next year, have um, the law which will state if you're, a, if you're a bad guy, this is what is going to happen. But we won't have regulation for another year or two years or so. So we won't know what a bad, bad guy is <laughs> or what, what a bad um, behavior is. So probably uh, we'll be in this, this uh, weird environment where um, bigger companies will probably be more scared in, in investing locally because there will be those consequences, but not that guidance as to how can we avoid those consequences. But uh, hopefully the, there's light at the end of the tunnel, so hopefully that tunnel is going to be real short, uh, but real efficient. Well, thank you both for that. Um, and, and just given that we have startups and established corporates on the panel here, I'm wondering you know, if you could, could both expand on what happens to the responsibility and, and the ethics when you are working with a third party organization like a startup who is now either using your data or you're going to use their solutions? How do you kind of wrap your head around that or wrap your legal around that? Yeah, so we have worked uh, with Plug and Play on a couple of things, and we have some other partners as well that we work on various machine learning projects with. And we take a lot of the responsibility internally to explain the implications of our data, to explain the regulations that we expect to be maintained around our data and to be maintained around any kind of project we're partaking in. And we ask a lot of questions. Um, perhaps slightly annoying sometimes to people, but also usually it's a very productive conversation. I mean, uh, there's things that happen and that are required for airlines to follow that I had no idea as just a passenger when I was flying with WestJet. And now that I've seen behind the curtain, I know those things. And it's my responsibility to make sure anybody I'm collaborating with also knows those things and understands their responsibility in upholding those regulations as well. So we do our best to educate and we do our best to have our own checks and balances in place whenever we're working with somebody uh, or a new project or a new team to make sure that what we need to happen is still happening with the various data, the various models, whatever it is. It's uh, really similar where we have a very heavy due diligence process. Um, our right to operate is our own, so we have to make sure that all of our uh, service providers oblige to our own obligation. So we provide a lot of training. As I said, compliance is very powerful in our uh, in our company. Uh, so we we provide training. We uh, we sign agreements uh, to share uh, very transparently. Uh, and 
both ways uh, to make sure that whenever we will, because we will be audited, we are able to answer the questions that are coming our way. So yeah, it's, it's our responsibility and we're um, making sure that we are um, uh, taking the hand of whatever partner we're, we have in uh, guiding them into this uh, minefield that is healthcare compliance. <laughs> Well, and, and so I'd love to hear sort of the startup's perspective. And, and I guess, you know, I'm using the term startup, although both of your companies are more scale-ups, I think is probably the right term. I, I'm still fuzzy on when you go from a, scale, uh, from a startup to a scale-up, but um, from a startup's perspective, right, you're trying to work with these, uh, you know, companies that are highly regulated. What do you have to do as a startup founder trying to grow your company? Let's start with you, Ken. Uh, yeah, so on the ethical side, it's an interesting conversation because um, just as both Kim and uh, my colleague here indicated, being a biotech company in the healthcare space, there's lots and lots of regulations that we need to adhere to. And so um, on average at Ciantra, we have auditors coming through the door like once every six months. Um, and to add to that, I think the way we wrap up this conversation is, is the principles of uh, responsible AI. So there's the transparency, the privacy and safety and all that stuff. You probably know that transparency is right on top, and it's very, very important for um, companies the size of Ciantra to ensure that there's transparency in data building, machine learning, um, everything from design development all the way to deployment. Part of that is then the ethical responsibility and just being very, very transparent in all what's being done across the organization. And most of this actually comes down to the documentation that supports all the efforts. So, Again, being a healthcare company, there's lots and lots of standards that we'd adhere to. Um, and on the transparency side, I think the FDA is basically leading the charge at this point um, in terms of setting the bar so high in regulating AI, AI and ML-enabled um, medical devices. The EU is, I think, two steps back. Um, they've been talking about the AI Act for several years now, but the goal or the expectation at least is that that's gonna be released sometime this year or early next year. Um, but again, it's just being transparent, it's being um, properly establishing documentation to support what you're doing, just so when these auditors come in with confidence, you can say that you are doing what you've indicated that you're gonna do. Kelly, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'll talk about things more from a practical standpoint, because as the enterprise space really drove a lot of our uh, product roadmap, um, especially, you know, enterprises, like, like one of our customers is Nike. But I, I, as the CEO of the company, can't even peer into the data to see what's coming in the, the Jordan brand shoes for 2024, right? So what that needed to do was drive a number of things. The first was we needed to have a system that can be deployed, all models deployed within the environment of the customer, okay? So not one shred of data ever leaves. We're not replicating data. We're not storing it a different way. It's going against the, the, the core warehouse. The second piece is, as you can imagine, at the data warehouse level, you get tons and tons of conflict when it comes to unique data, right? LeBron may exist in nine to 13 different columns, which are within similar contexts. So you need a model that actually understands and can disambiguate between those unique terms. Well, we can't train that on our side. So then we needed to build something that can actually, the moment it's deployed in the environment, can train another specific model, okay? Thirdly, and it goes to the explainability piece. If you put a bunch of uh, like a visualization from weights and biases in front of a non-technical business person, they're, gonna, they're not gonna know what they're looking at, right? Oh, these are, this is the activation pathways and they're never gonna know that. So then another special model had to be built which ended up disassociating the original natural language query from the database query that was generated. And it just takes that generated query and back translates that to mechanical English. So in the context of, uh, we work in the financial market space, a trader coming in saying, show me all golden sweeps with, a, with a, all, all leap golden sweeps, right? So they would ask that question, get interpreted, build the database query, execute it, and then would return back in the interpreted as, as saying all, tr all options trades with a premium over $1 million that are multi-sweep side that expire in over 365 days right? Just to ensure that it's not just returning exactly what the natural language query was, but providing that disconnect between the query and the database query so that when it's back translated to English, that person can actually see, did it get all the conditions that I was looking for? And did it understand properly? So it's still not 100% perfect, 
But the point is, is it shows that that non-technical business person, here's how the system was actually interpreting it, right? So long story, it drove, Enterprise Space drove a ton of our, our product roadmap for sure, as well as some of the innovations. So uh, as a startup, we can't just kind of groan about regulation and everything. It actually drives a lot of innovation for sure. And it's our job as vendors to ensure that we're actually producing, uh, you know, producing things that are, that are not only ethical, but at the same time really scalable uh, within the enterprise organization. Fantastic, thank you. All right, let's shift gears a little bit. And you know, the, the title of this, uh, this panel is around the business of AI. So let's talk a little bit about business. And let's talk about real world examples of how you have, and you know, for all of our panelists, uh, worked with either vendors or worked with customers to deploy your solutions. Um, I'd love to hear sort of a, a, a two-sided question. You know, I'd love to hear an example of something that went really well. And, and you know, we, can, we can move a layer up so we're not talking about specific company names or, or technologies or anything like that. Uh, but I'd also love to hear you know, something that's maybe more of a lesson learned that you wouldn't do again. Um, so let's, uh, to rephrase that question, you know, can you discuss a successful and a non-successful collaboration between your company and another company in the AI space? So does anybody want to jump in first with, uh, with an example? Yeah, I can start. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, our, probably our most successful one, of course, was Nike, just because it was, we started one business unit, you know, the, the typical land and expand you want to get, moved into global merchandising, then demand generation, now been introduced to supply chain. So it was successful because we, you know, the technology worked as expected, but more importantly, uh, it really taught us, our champions were really good at navigating the enterprise space and knowing which stakeholders to, you know, it's not just about the, the, the VP and business unit XYZ, you also need to know who owns the data, which we were talking about a, a little bit earlier as well, which is super important. Um, one that didn't really go super well was more on how long everything took. And part of the reason how long everything took is, and again, we were talking about this earlier, you ask a data person about, you know, hey, is, do you want to expose this data to, to a, a business person? And everybody says, oh, my data is not in good shape, right? My data is horrible, it's dirty, we got no values in there, it's going to screw everybody up, everything from there. And what we found, and this was very apparent in this particular case, is, you know those people who you walk into their house and they're like, oh, my house is dirty and it's cleaner than anything I've ever had in my house before? That's, that's what data people who look after data warehouses are like, right? So we, it didn't go very well and, and took months and months of extra time just navigating through this, you know what, we should have been much more clear right up front in, in, in where do we draw the line? Right? Where is it, you know, we'll be the first to admit if we can work with that or we can't work with that, but navigating the conversation that way versus just getting the objection of our data is not in a good spot uh, and now we're stuck from there, right? So it's a huge lesson learned for us, which, uh, you know, we have to be careful with in the future. And I'll, I'll ask one follow-up question because I'm sure any startups in the audience are probably thinking this, you know, Nike, right? Like, I would assume as an outsider, they've got a huge team working in data science and, and, and looking at this internally. How did you find that sort of foot in the door to, to allow your company to get in and work with them? Yeah, I mean, they've been through every BI tool. And again, we're not solving the BI problem. We're, we're a little bit different than that. But um, they, they tried to use every BI tool, every conversational AI out there. But they're still based, the conversational AIs are based on the views. So they put that aside. They had a project with OpenAI to try to do something like that. But the, the autoregressive LLM is just, you can't provide fuzzy results that are inconsistent when it comes to database queries. Like, you have to, you have to either be brilliant and execute or fail miserably and provide some other type of answer, right? Because um, there's got to be redundancy there. So they tried a lot of stuff. And actually, concurrently in our pilot is when they were doing their work with OpenAI. Uh, and it just ended up working out in our favor. Like I said, we had really good champions. Uh, and most importantly, they had a huge need, right? They're just, their backlog for their poor data analysts and BI analysts was so massive, it was taking a couple weeks to answer questions. Then you have people making non-data-driven decisions that are, you know, ten million dollar decisions. It just it doesn't end up well at all. So uh, the pain was there, which I guess is the most important thing. If you're not solving a big problem, then no one cares. 
Absolutely. I think, Ken, you were ready to jump in with an example as well, so we'll go over to you next. Uh, yeah, so um, being in the space in which we are, we tend to solve or face more problems than, than solutions. And um, there's a typical example we have, and I think it's a lesson for um, anyone venturing in the startup space, is, is around version control. Um, so we have um, contracted software development, um, the architecture reserved to, <coughs> excuse me, a cargo-based company. And um, the goal is that there's proper documentation, as you all know. Um, in addition to that is uh, the very customary statement that um, programmers are not um, good at documenting what they do. It's very easy to go in and just make a tweak um, in the model and expect it to work that day, you fix the bug, but um, it's not being documented. So that's one um, lesson I'd like to pass along. Um, the second is just hammering on the point of um, version control. So um, being in the healthcare space, um, we work with very tight um, regulatory requirements. And the expectation is with that, and the FDA again is leading the effort, they call it the algorithm change control program. Um, the objective with that is to ensure that if risk management, for example, is conducted on a particular version of the software, um, then that's the version that's released. And if there need to be any changes, those changes basically go through a well-defined protocol and procedures. And that is super important because um, not just on documenting those changes, but now, uh, <coughs> excuse me, looking at a, a full feedback loop, how those changes eventually affect every aspect of the device, be it risk management, um, be it design, uh, be it post-market surveillance. So um, that would be a pretty uh, significant change on um, for any medical device. On the more successful side, I think um, it's about, again, demonstrating um, compliance to EU requirements um, because there is um, a landscape of regulatory requirements, um, not just on the IVDR or the IVDD um, for the EU, but there's um, some auxiliary standards that uh, we need to adhere to. And so actually preparing that documentation to adhere or to show compliance to those um, standards um, is one of the things that it's pretty important to pass along. Um, and and Seantra was pretty successful in that regard. Health, Health Canada has pretty much a similar um, way of seeing it, where we have seen some AI-enabled uh, tool being approved in the health space, but they're uh, closed or closed circuit uh, uh, algorithms, so they're not able to, to learn. Right. Um, as you said, um, if, if there is new learning, then you have to go through the, the process uh, again. Yeah, that's a great point because um, I'm fortunate enough to be a member of um, several working groups that are looking at proper implementation of both the MDR and the IVDR. And in these conversations, they tell you nearly 100% of the time, if you have um, an AI-enabled or machine learning-enabled medical device that is actively learning, it's not going to be certified. So it needs to be locked and version controlled and procedures and processes adequately documented to demonstrate that. And when the auditors come to the door, that's exactly one of the first few things they're looking at. Are you actively learning? If you are, then there's huge problems. Interesting. Uh, let's hear from uh, uh, Justin or Kim. Um, you know, going back to the original question again, you know, successful, not so successful examples of working with third parties. Um, I'll talk about the Canadian journey uh, around AI. Um, so right at the peak of the pandemic, uh, within the Canadian affiliate, a few uh, like-minded pe people decided that uh, we would build, I wasn't there, uh, but we, because now I'm part of this family, build a standard of excellence around AI. And they've uh, went out and built partnership with the three uh, AI research institutes in Canada. The goal was to uh, get the, these three institutes plus uh, whoever uh, follows them around the same table, thinking about, okay, we have this COVID like, crisis right now. What can we do? What, what simple solution can we bring forward to help manage, better manage healthcare? Uh, and they've developed like a hundred type of solutions from very simple to more complex. How many of these have been implemented? None. Because uh, you, can, um, you can go to the healthcare system, say, I have the most uh, pristine car that will allow you to go from A to B. But if they're not, if they're 
within, if they're in a crisis, they don't have enough people, they don't have enough resources, they don't have enough money, they don't have enough anything, they're not looking to implement new stuff. So that was uh, a great learning that you have, we had uh, a lot of research around the table, we didn't have necessarily enough people who were uh, going to, uh, to push the, those innovation into not necessarily called commercialization, but that's, that's the step we are looking at, but mostly implementation. So having everyone around the table is, is something that's very crucial. We do, we do have a lot of successes though, um, and very different ones. Uh, briefly, we've uh, one patient organization um, called End ALS uh, around um, uh, people with ALS, uh, they had uh, patient data, they didn't know what to do about, and we had a lot of friends, so they asked us, what should we do? So we helped them build a two now uh, uh, Kaggle challenges and uh, found different teams that were willing to work on these data sets to try to, uh, to better identify um, um, ways to diagnose the, the, the disease or to treat uh, people. So um, although we were not, uh, our own data scientists are not necessarily driving this, uh, we were really proud to, um, to help the gears uh, turn in, in, in this, uh, this topic. Um, um, what else would I, was I wanted to say? I forget. There was another example that I, was really cool. We, I have another cool example. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll jump over to Kim and we'll come back to you if you yeah. think of the example. Feel free to interrupt me if you think of your example. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll start off with uh, one partnership that maybe didn't work out, and it was a really good learning experience. It was something that happened very early on when I started at WestJet, uh, and when I started too, maybe I was a little bit naive and thinking that, okay, WestJet's an airline, and there's lots of airlines out there, and they all have kind of similar problems that they're probably working on, and there's lots of startups and tools out there that have been successfully implemented in, say, some of our American counterparts. And they look really cool. They look really promising. They, they look like they could deliver a lot of value to WestJet. And so we'd be in meetings with these groups or these teams, and we'd hear about it, and we're like, yes, this is so cool. We want to do this. This is amazing. We need this here. And we'd try it out. So whether it was a certain kind of data set that they were giving us access to that we could add to our analysis, uh, different kinds of optimization tools that they had that worked really well in, in the States, and we would try them out. And they would fail catastrophically. And I learned very quickly that a Canadian airline is very different than an American airline. And even just when you think about like connectivity in the States versus in Canada, there's a lot more distance that has to be traveled between different airports in Canada. And it's not maybe as densely connected as what we would see in the States. And some of the things uh, that we would have great data for in the States, we don't have the equivalent data for in Canada. And so we can't just make that leap that, hey, this worked really great at Delta. It's not necessarily gonna work really great at WestJet. And so we learned as a team really quickly what kinds of questions that we need to ask in order to figure out, hey, is this a general solution for all airlines? Or is this a cool model that if we wanted to implement something similar, we would need this team, this company to really invest a bunch of time and have a, we'd have a huge ask from them in order to redo or make another model that would work for the Canadian space as well. So it was a very, very interesting uh, learning experience and it's helped dr drive a lot of our conversations with our partners now. And then I'll talk about a, a, success, a more successful story uh, that's fairly recent, actually, and has to do with Microsoft and OpenAI. So OpenAI is huge. ChatGPT is huge. We had lots of conversations internally at our uh, community of practice of, hey, what kinds of problems could we potentially use ChatGPT as a solution for, or the OpenAI models as a solution for? And we had big brainstorming sessions with our anyone from the org that was interested in participating. So we had pilots that would come and flight attendants that would come and baggage handlers that would come and say, hey, like, let's use it for this. This is a problem for me. I would like a solution. I think ChatGPT could do it. We're like, cool. So let's try something. Uh, my team, we're very small, wonderful team, very intelligent people, 
And one of our best assets is we know what we're good at and we know what we don't know. And we did not know how to do prompt engineering <laughs> when it came to the open AI models. We hadn't used them yet. But we do partner very closely with Microsoft who happened to heavily invest in open AI and they were willing to help show us we took a couple of our use cases. We said, okay, these would make sense to do like really quick POCs. They showed us how to do the prompt engineering. They showed us all of this wonderful information around how we could actually leverage those models in our business. We learned a lot from them. They got some really cool use cases out of it and it was a great like really quick partnership where hopefully some of those things will actually end up getting integrated into our Western environment in the near future. We'll see. Exciting. Um, I was here in Edmonton last week for the Canadian Airports Conference, and that was a recurring theme that came up time and time again, is that one size does not fit all when it comes to airports and airlines. And I'm curious if you can expand on it. You know, I know Delta is a, is it a, the, the proper term, it's a partner co-chairing? It's a co-chair co -chair partner. Us. Yeah. Um, what would be so different from a Delta to a WestJet? I have a bit of a funny answer and then a more serious answer. Um, well, if you look at their profits, they're significantly different. <laughs> and it shows you kind of the magnitude that they operate on versus what we're able to operate on. So they are a much larger company. They have a lot more aircraft going out. They have a lot more connectivity. Um, it's very different in terms of, say, even things like I'm from Saskatoon. The Saskatoon airport, like all of Saskatchewan has less people than Calgary, right? We have two airports in Saskatchewan. Do we need two airports in Saskatchewan? I don't know. That's probably not up to me to decide, but it does have lots of impl implications, right? There's three gates at the Saskatoon airport, three, maybe four, five, sorry if I'm getting that wrong, Sky XYE, I'm, I apologize in advance. There's not that many airports. You go to somewhere like Minneapolis, it is huge in comparison. There's a lot more moving parts, a lot more staff, a lot more efficiencies that can happen there versus somewhere like uh, Saskatoon. You look at what happened in December with flying and the snowstorm in Vancouver and how it effectively grounded all of the Canadian airlines for like what a couple weeks because there was snow in Vancouver and they didn't have shovels to get rid of the snow, they didn't have the, the, the ability to deal with that. And that's not necessarily something they deal with in Florida, right? <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> there's lots of different challenges that we face. And, and honestly, like the population densities and how spread out they are, think about going north in Canada. They don't have that kind of same experience in the States. Um, all sorts of different things like that, that just really really impact our ability to take something that Delta is doing and just plop it into the WestJet environment. That makes a lot of sense. I'm glad I could help. No, no snow shoveling in Florida, at least uh, not in the immediate future. Hopefully never. <laughs> <laughs> um, so staying along this theme of business and AI, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, from kind of shifting gears as opposed to working external, thinking internal with your organizations, both the, the startups and, and the, the corporations on the panel, um, what are some really specific, um, really interesting AI tools that you've deployed and implemented within your companies and, and how have they really impacted your day-to-day -day operations? Is there anyone that would like to start on that question? I can start. Sure. <laughs> with more fun airline examples. Um, and also kind of related to what was happening last year at airports. Uh, everybody knows about the bag drama <laughs> that we all saw all over social media. Bags sitting in rooms in the back of airports and, and different things like that. Uh, our team currently is working really, really closely with our operations team on improving everything that we do with bags and how it touches all different pieces of the operation. So before... I look at Sam because she's doing this work. Uh, before, what, a year ago, we had no insight into how many bags we would likely get on a plane before people actually checked in for their flight, so day of, right? There was no insight. So we couldn't really adequately plan our ground crew. We couldn't plan our equipment. We couldn't do any kind of really for forward thinking planning around that. We just kind of, people would show up at the airport with the bags and we would deal with it. We had someone from operations come to us and say, hey, 
We have a lot of data about how many bags have flown. This seems like something we could maybe use machine learning for. And we're like, yes, absolutely. We would, we would love to help you with this problem. And so we built up a model that will predict from zero days out to seven days out, the amount of bags that are likely to be on every single WestJet flight in our network. And it's a, an excellent model with a really, really low error that our operations team can then take and say, hey, this flight is going to have a whole bunch of baggage, and so is this flight over here where a lot of guests are going to be connecting. Maybe we should place those closer together at this airport so they can more easily share that equipment. We don't have crew running from one terminal all the way over to another terminal with all these bags. Things should move a little bit better. We should have less mishandled bag baggage, et cetera, et cetera. Our in-flight team can use it to say, hey, there's a, a sold out flight we have here and uh, not a lot of baggage is being checked. We are probably gonna have a carry on problem. <laughs> we probably need to get some volunteers to check baggage at the gate, which I know nobody typically likes to do. But at least they can know that ahead of time, they can start working at when people are checking in at the airport, getting those bags through the proper process so that the flight would still leave on time and different things like that. So baggage has been a huge one for us that we've been working on recently. Um, but I, ha I could honestly talk about all sorts of cool, cool things at the airport that we're, we're helping with. So I'll let other people talk first, and then if I have more time, I'll, I'll take more time. Well, and, and uh, just to, because I know you're kind of being put on the spot representing all of travel. Um, so uh, last week it was discussed that the, the baggage problem that we all experience as passengers cannot be solved by the airlines alone. They really need that collaboration with the, uh, with the airports. And I think these aren't my words, but they referred to the gate check as the black hole for baggage. Yeah. I don't it, like it bypasses gate most of the systems, yes. but not all. Yes. And so we'd like not, to prevent not saying that you shouldn't happening. gate check, but <laughs> check your bags early. Yeah. And we're just trying to have our insights and do our part to help with the baggage problem, right? Like everyone. Yeah who works with airports, with airlines. We all share responsibility there. And so we need to be doing everything we can to make sure that it's not us holding anything back, right? That we're supporting all the partners that we work with at the airports. We're making everything as easy as possible for them. And it's easy as possible for our staff that also works at the airports, right? And our guests at the end of the day are gonna be who, who benefits, so. Absolutely. Win -win. I love hearing that real world application of machine learning because that's something that you would, I think for most people that aren't involved would assume like, oh, the airlines have all this data, the, the airports have this data, they must be doing it already. But, you know, as we were talking about before we got started here this morning, you know, a lot of the technologies that we are seeing being implemented today in business didn't even exist two to five years ago. So these are brand new things where it takes that business unit to say, hey, I wonder if we could solve this, right? And I love hearing these examples. Yeah, I could uh, keep talking, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but the first step is, is effective data sharing because uh, there's a lot of those important data that we need to pull to move forward are divided in different custodians. So you're actually your example of uh, talking about uh, how Nike was uh, the, the data owner. Uh, that's, that's the example I forgot. Um, so in our, uh, in, our, in our organization, you have, we have two types of data. So we have patient data that data that is owned by the patient. But um, we are the custodian of these because we are running clinical trials. But you ha always have to remember the owner is the patient. Um, but we also have organizational data. Um, so we are implementing uh, NLPs. We have our own internal chatbots. We have um, uh, literature screening. We have our own translation tool because um, as you would have probably guess, uh, I cannot use, uh, I, using an LLM or chat GPT is very uh, dangerous for us because we're handling a lot of very private data and you don't want to have any kind of breach. Um, so that conversation about like who owns the data and who is the custodian, what are our rights in using that data is a very important conversation. So not necessarily 
an AI example, but it, it, that conversation needs to happen to, to lead to, to AI uh, in the end. And we're having that conversation in uh, BC around uh, uh, precision oncology, where we're having a, a partnership with BC Cancer, where we uh, are pulling our da data from our clinical trials, data from their omics uh, testing, and trying to see if we can uh, build bridges in uh, allowing patients to access innovative med medicine sooner. Um, so uh, not, not uh, trying to, uh, to, to answer an unmet need uh, as soon as possible. So uh, that's, that's, that's something uh, we're trying to do. And um, in developing diagnostic tools, uh, you would imagine a lot of AI and ML goes into high throughput machines. Like we have, we're building machines that uh, scan uh, cells uh, at a, such a rapid pace uh, you, you cannot like imagine, and we're talking about also um, uh, gene profiling, uh, where 20 something years ago, it took weeks to do one gene of one person, and now it's a matter of, of minutes, I think, to the entire genome. So uh, building these high throughput and uh, advancing forward, uh, there's a lot of AI ML go that goes into this. Yeah, I mean, internally, we use ChatGPT for non <laughs> I think there's 100 million people who have breached employment agreements, I, I think. Not us, not lost. us. But, but not as us long either. as there's nothing, yeah, as long as there's nothing proprietary, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's one of the best tools to overcome blank page syndrome, which a lot of people get. Just, it, it's, it's never perfect, the content you get out of it, but it just gets you so, so much further, right? Or if you're trying to plan a meeting, or even if you want to know something simple like, you know, the, the, the biggest insurers in Australia. You know, I don't care if that data is old. <laughs> it doesn't need to be real time. I just need to know the answer versus here's a bunch of search results and then I got to spend more time uh, digging into it. So we, I mean, that's something, uh, you know, myself personally for sure uses a ton internally. Uh, it's, it's super, super useful. Ken, any tools that you uh, you guys are using at Cyantra that you want to share? Uh, yeah, so we use a broad range of tools and um, so it's, going to start from decision trees, regression-based models, all the way to neural networks. Um, and one of the things we try to do is to leverage the limitations as well as the advantages of each of these tools. Um, because as the phrase goes, garbage in, garbage out. And um, we are in the healthcare space again. We're looking at gene expression profiles. Um, and something very, very minute could, um, could change those profiles. And so to the extent possible, um, we try to um, keep the system as uh, robust as possible. Um, the gene expression signature itself is being trained against um, a training set and want to make sure that at every point in the process, um, the test set is as replicative as, um, uh, um, or the data that is in the test set was acquired in a very similar way to the data in the training set. Because if you don't do that, then it's like training a model in Saskatoon and trying to deploy it in Edmonton, which of course doesn't work by any means. Yeah. So I know that a lot of industries right now are looking at ways that they can be more sustainable. And I think that both travel and healthcare, um, those are, it's a big focus area for both industries. Um, I'm curious, are there any sort of insights or any uh, things that you may be putting into practice that are leveraging AI and ML that are actually helping uh, address some of the sustainability challenges of your industries? <laughs> okay, I will. It's actually really interesting that you're bringing this question up now because I was in a meeting last week uh, talking about some potential projects that we'd like to get started with our pilots. Um, so our pilots are incredibly intelligent individuals and flying a plane is way more complicated than I could have ever managed or imagined. I thought it was complicated. It's tenfold complicated to that. Um, and one of the things that they'll be doing while they're in flight is trying to optimize their flight path to be as fuel efficient as possible. So, and again, um, excuse me if I use any incorrect terms here, I am not a pilot, <laughs> I just benefit from them. But say we're up in the air and they can uh, ride some wind drifts, Sam, <laughs> help. <laughs> Uh, 
to give us a little bit of a boost so we don't have to burn as much fuel. They'll be going through all of the data that they're given in the cockpit to try to figure out, okay, I should be flying at this height right now or I should be moving over a little bit over here and they're navigating all of that themselves to do that for them. For them. We were asked, could we take some of that knowledge and integrate it into a model? So that, say, some of our newer pilots, they don't need to have 20 years of experience to get the same data that they need in order to make the right decision. We can leverage that information that our very, very senior pilots have and help it help benefit some of our more junior pilots to just be uh, a little bit better in terms of how much fuel we're actually spending. We spend a lot of time talking about how much stuff we're actually flying. So even things like uh, catering that we have on board. How many straws do we have? How heavy is that? How much fuel are we burning because we have too many straws on board or too many cans of Coke or too much whatever? We want to have the precise amount that we need to make our guests happy and not an excessive amount so that we're burning fuel just for, for what purpose, right? So we're going to be launching a project as well where we're looking at optimizing the catering and the buy on board products for every single WestJet flight across, a, across our network, which will be really interesting. And then even things like the baggage. So how can we figure out how guests are flowing through each individual airport to try to optimize, optimize gate assignments so that we're not having um, those baggage carts drive across huge airports, like yes, yeah, somewhere in Saskatoon probably isn't gonna make a huge difference, but in some of our bigger airports, like Calgary, even Edmonton feels like a really big airport to me, uh, it, it will make a really big difference, right? If we can get that right, and then ultimately, these are all gonna be things in, that we put in place as the, the industry of, as a whole is working towards uh, more sustainable fuel sources for planes, whether that's hydro, electric, you name it, right? So. All, all of us are kind of working together towards the same goal again. <laughs> Excellent, Justin, you know, I think that question was a little more geared towards the travel industry. So maybe I'll, I'll throw a different one your way if that's okay. all right, unless you have an answer that you wanted to. Uh, uh, no, um, okay. <laughs> we're, we're heavily thinking about it. Like we, in developing our own product, we have, uh, we have um, um, uh, product plans and we're, we're working in this way, but I don't have a specific example yeah. for you. I was shaking my boots. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that one, a little more travel. So on, on the health side, though, I think there were some specific ones that I had here. Um, so the healthcare industry has, has long faced the challenge of bias in clinical trials. Um, re, er, sorry, clinical research and care delivery. How have you taken that into consideration when you think about training your models that you may use at Roche? Um, so... Bias uh, is cannot be avoided. Um, it exists, and we have to acknowledge that it is there. Um, the more, because <clears throat> when you're talking about a specialty product, you're going to, um, it's going to be um, aimed to a specific subpopulation of probably a subpopulation. So at some point, you have to make choices. Um, what you, what we have to do is to consciously add, um, add positive bias um, and manage, not not try to negate it, not try to have it zero, but have manage, manageable bias so we could drive uh, positive outcomes. Um, you're right that um, historically there's been there's there's uh, a long a long line of uh, inequalities uh, in health uh, even in Canada where we all believe it's it's health for all uh, there are still a lot of, a lot of inequalities uh, in our country and uh, AI will and uh, digital health will help to alleviate all, a lot of these uh, these constraints in uh, virtual access to care, but also in allowing a more precise medicine. So products are evolving. Um, we're not so much in the business anymore of uh, producing this, these big blockbusters that are one size fits all. We're into, um, even in oncology, it's, now precision oncology. It's, as I said, the subpopulation of a subpopulation. So disease are, um, projects are being targeted uh, more and more efficiently uh, to uh, very specific disease. So um, when you're, 
when you want to then um, screen a population, make sure the right product gets to the right person at the right time, then we will need to be a lot better at uh, diagnostic diagnosis and making sure that uh, no one gets uh, gets left behind. So that's where um, that's where AI can can help us uh, manage all of this uh, flow of information because. Um, what was asked of uh, healthcare uh, practitioners before it was to treat a disease, treat, treat a patient. Uh, but at some point, they were asked, well, also collect data. Um, and today, they're um, getting back to us saying, well, if you can help me uh, alleviate that administrative admin burden of collecting the data, of uh, synthesizing the data, I'll be able to treat more patients. Um, so that's also uh, something that uh, AI can, can help in. Uh, you've probably all heard about Ask the Facts, uh, the trend that we need to stop having faxes in our hospitals. I say we should also think about removing the keyboards. Doctor doesn't have to, <laughs> doesn't have, to have a keyboard in his office. Um, AI could help uh, help um, help them uh, capture information uh, more efficiently uh, in a in a better flow in their day. Uh, we could also um, add patient reported outcome to this. So uh, all this to say that was a really big drift from your your question. Sorry, um, we have to manage bias. <laughs> yes. So so are, am I hearing Alexas in every doctor's office then to get rid of the keyboards, just voice assistants, natural language processing? It's it's happening. Um, some EMR vendors are uh, offering a solution where doctors can. Uh, there's NLP where it's uh, voice to speech and uh, their notes are uh, dictated uh, in real time. Much more efficient than a keyboard. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, all right, so I want to kind of bring it back. I, I know we started this session off with a really bad joke from ChatGPT. Uh, so I want to kind of bring it back to, to ChatGPT again. Um, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have, have heard the, the pace of innovation is accelerating uh, and heard some of the examples of, you know, the iPhone took several years to reach 100 million users from when it was launched. TikTok um, and Instagram, well, Instagram, I think, took two and a half years. TikTok, nine months to go from zero to 100 million users. ChatGPT has now gone from zero to 100 million users in roughly two months. So my question to the panel is, what does that mean for business? Because we've seen this before with the iPhone. The iPhone was a bit of a, a Trojan horse that Apple used to get from the consumer into the business as opposed to the traditional business approach that was dominated by Microsoft. So now with ChatGPT on the rise, and you've got a variety of people around the table with ChatGPT, what does it mean for business that users have this tool in their hands and 100 million plus users have this tool in their hands? Does anybody want to start? Yeah, I, I can. I, I mean, I think ChatGPT is going to be a norm for a lot of very specific tasks, right? It's really good at a lot of different things. You know, and, and, you know, alluding back to the sustainability question as well, I think people are going to be in for a big surprise when you put in these billions to trillion parameter models in your own environment and try train that. <laughs> see how long it's going to take, see how much energy usage it's going to be, realizing that, oh, I screwed the training data up, so we've got to restart everything again. And you just, it's just this, I mean, I know the data scientists know it's this, this cyclical problem. Um, so... How is it going to affect the business there? I think when you can use it in non-proprietary ways until they figure out how to deploy it, but at the same time, and, and everybody's probably seen this on the news too, the offices of the CFOs from all the cloud compute costs are starting to crack down on all the enterprises to say, okay, uh, this is getting out of control. Now you add in training these billion parameter models internally, you, you, you're not going to be able to do that in the cloud. You're going to need like Hewlett Packard Enterprise has a new on-prem device you can use, which is almost like a supercomputer, substantially cheaper to do it that way. Um, but you're going to end up seeing a ton of that stuff. So in the real world, everyone's excited right now, but at the same time, we have to remember what's the right tool for the job. If, if the chat GPT sledgehammer is the right tool, awesome, let's use it. But there's a lot of other things that you can customize 
uh, different transformers as an example uh, that you can utilize as part of different pipelines to get to what you're trying to solve uh, at the end of the day. Um, so it's not just about the bigger sledgehammer all the time. Uh, you have to be real practical in, in the approach uh, in the real world of business. But I mean, we can't get ourselves chat GPT and you know, some of the other uh, autoregressive LLM technologies out there. They're here to stay for sure, there's no doubt. Yeah, I just want to chime in and say, um, especially um, for highly regulated industries, I think it's, uh, it's going to become a bigger challenge um, because um, in as much as these devices are um, being flown around and there's a very rapid pace of design and development, um, I think a key note here is that regulators are not keeping up to pace. Um, and that's huge because, um, for example, the FDA, in an, in an attempt to be more transparent, they went ahead last year and released um, all the AI and ML enabled um, devices that they had approved. And there were actually lots of question marks than, than answers from the FDA's um, side of the business. But again, you look at um, ChatGPT now, for example, um, and you look at the global regulatory landscape and how far behind all these jurisdictions are in terms of regulating these devices. For me, I think that's the biggest risk. And, and bouncing on about your answers, um, it's it's certainly open up opening up a conversation, and it's it's bringing awareness to. Um, the higher levels that uh, these tools are coming, and they're very impactful. Um, whether it, it is going to be ChatGPT or another uh, AI tool that's going to rev revolutionize how we do business, it's, gonna, it's happening. It's not just going to happen. Um, and But yeah, in, in our sector, we're also uh, mobilizing because um, because of the lack of regulation, and because as 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 long as there is this lack of regulation, we're not going to be able to move forward at the pace that we want to. Um, yeah. I don't think anything will ever move fast enough for a lot of people on my team, and myself included. When we see a new technology, and we're so excited and we want to use it. And then we start talking to our cybersecurity team and um, our infrastructure teams. And we're like, hey, we want to do this. And they're like, that's nice. Uh, we're going to need to go through a technology review board and look at all of this and see how it's all happening. And if you really want to play with this, well, you can use some public data that's on our website to, to do that. And so. A lot of the stuff that is really exciting and seems like it will be really revolutionary is still going through all those checks and balances internally to make sure that we're using it responsibly as an organization and that we're not exposing any of our data, our guest data, um, to, to uh, like any kind of threats, right? So there's a, a huge part of that where we're still trying to be responsible with it and then still do cool things at the same time. So I did mention we at WestJet have done a couple open AI POCs uh, where we were looking at things, even just like our website data. Can we take our website data, plop it into an open AI model and build up, say, like a virtual travel agent that guests could then leverage to help them make travel plans for where we go or things like that. Uh, we have a chat bot on our website called Juliet. Juliet is really great at some things and really bad at other things. So. We know what those are. If we used an open AI backend instead, would we be able to gain anything from that? We can kind of start looking at those things uh, where it's a little more uh, <laughs> palatable for the business in terms of the security and, and different things like that to, to really look at that uh, technology and see how we could integrate it while those other checks and balances are going on so that if we did one day want to use it to search some of our internal documents for, say, like our contact center agents, so that instead of doing a keyword search, they're just kind of having a conversation with all of these documents that that would have all gone through that review process already and we would be able to integrate it in at, at that point. But can't do that until it's gone through all those things. Is there a, a literacy challenge in your organizations? Like, um, I could speak for myself where um, now every, everybody's excited with ChatGPT and I, people who know are like, yes, there's a lot of other cool stuff and ChatGPT is not necessarily the right tool for us, but happy to, to see you're excited. Now let's redirect your excitement to something that's really gonna happen and really have 
um, uh, cool outcomes for, for the patients. Yeah, so I used to be a professor, so I was used to a lot of that like redirecting excitement into like, this is what this actually means. Um, and one thing that I will say that's been awesome about ChatGPT and the popularity is that a lot of our stakeholder groups and people that are not data scientists at WestJet got excited about it. And they came to us and they said, we have these problems, can you help? And we're like, yes, <laughs> we would love to help because we're just a bunch of nerds who really, really like cool, interesting problems and we would love to help. And so even if it isn't a chat GTP problem, they might think it is, they might be using the wrong language, we can help educate, we can take them along the journey of what does that solution actually look like for the business problem you have. So that's been an awesome thing that's come out yeah, of it for us. It, it's like the, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? That's that's kind of uh, where we see. But you know, we were, you know, Kim and I were talking earlier about, uh, you know, and, and really the impact of, of, of AI in business. And do you notice how all the most successful examples are actually uh, models that get built to to empower a person to do something? They're not replacing what the person's doing. I know that a lot of people just say, you know, kind of say that because you're supposed to say that out there, right? Everybody's looking for the ultimate system that does everything for them, but that's still a little bit in, in, in magic land for sure. Um, but we, you know, we do know, and, and we've experienced this to the data literacy part, you, it is a fallacy when people say, oh, the business people don't know what questions to ask. That is a fallacy. They know exactly what questions to ask. They know what they want to know. They want to explore things, look for insights, uh, and then go from there. They just don't know what the data looks like in the database. They don't know if it's accessible to them. They don't know a lot of those people, but it's still, or a lot of those problems, but it still comes down to uh, AI is there as a tool to make our lives better at the end of the day. Uh, you know, it sounds cliche, but, but that is what it is. And as vendors, that's what we have to do. That's what we have to provide. I love that. Uh, it's, it's there to provide and, and sort of enable. And uh, I think that's what we've heard kind of come up multiple times here on the panel today. Uh, so we're getting near the end here, and we want to save some time for Q&A. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to give each panelist an opportunity. I know, Kelly, that was, a, that was almost a great, fantastic closing <laughs> statement that you gave there. But if you've got another one in your back pocket, we'll go to you last. But I wanted to give each one of the panelists an opportunity. If there's any you know, final thoughts, things that you, you thought of that you didn't get a chance to mention uh, that you'd like to share with the audience here before we jump to Q&A. We'll start over here. Ken? Um, yeah, I think... One of the things that is important um, in the space here, um, AI for different industries is, is getting the right team of experts around the table. And if I was to leave here with one recommendation, that would be it. Um, don't try to put a square peg in a round hole and so on. Um, make sure that, um, especially in the startup phase of any business, you are getting the right team of experts around the table who've been there, done it, and they understand what the pain points are. And if it's anything to venture in the healthcare space, make sure that um, there is a regulatory landscape map uh, mapped out appropriately um, for the different markets, um, for the different intentions. Um, and then I think one of the things we haven't talked um, about um, often today is um, the use of personal healthcare information, which is one of the things that has come out, um, especially for medical device manufacturers. And I know um, Justin mentioned um, the use or the um, the inclination towards um, towards precision medicine, um, but again, it's making sure that there is appropriate architectures set up um, to appropriately protect personal healthcare information, and that applies to all industries. Because, in as much as we, in good faith, try to make efforts to use AI the right way, there is the other guys in basement somewhere in Romania and Czechoslovakia who are aiming on the cybersecurity side to invade as many systems as possible and. Believe it or not, most of them, they do this for fun. And so I think when we, when we build this system, we need to make sure that there's appropriate plans in place to, to protect the goods um, that we're trying to bring forward. Yeah, a couple of things um, to this point. Um, we all, as I said, we are data uh, stewards, but we're, a lot of us uh, are acting as data protectors more than uh, responsible data custodians, and we need to uh, be more literate in uh, giving a second secondary value to that data and uh, expanding on all of this data that is collected, 
how can we use it in a, a more efficient way? Um, bouncing back to your comment in um, keeping the human in the loop, that's, uh, that is something that we say. Because <laughs> um, um, as I alluded to earlier, we're not in the business of replacing uh, anyone in the healthcare system. Uh, we're in, we're, what we want to do is to augment care. Honestly, what people want right now is to have access to a physician. And um, what we need as a collective uh, is to go for the low-hanging automation fruit. Uh, the more we automate, the more doctors and nurses can spend more time with people. And one last thing is I just, I'm just going to drop the ball of multimodality. That's the, our next frontier, uh, making sense of very different data sets uh, that all pretend to one maybe a single person that could help us understand uh, more holistically how a person uh, is going and is going to be in the next, uh, in the future. Digital twin? <laughs> Kim? I'll try to keep it short. I've been known to be talkative. <laughs> um, but it really just echoes what everybody else has said already. Everything that we're doing at WestJet in the AI and ML space, and even in the data science space, is just to provide the right data and the right insights, insights to the right business stakeholder at the right time. So we want to enable people to do their jobs better. We don't want our pilots working from home. We, we don't want <laughs> bags just put on robots that like move around the airport like that. That will never, I don't think, I can't, I can't see that happening um, anytime within my lifetime. So it's really, really just about giving the right insights to the right person and, and enabling them to do their job to the best of their ability. I always joke that I got into computer science because I wanted to automate things so I had more time to drink coffee. That hasn't happened. I automate things and I have more times to automate more things and more new problems come up and I work on more things. But uh, I haven't been able to automate myself out of a job yet, so I don't think I'll be able to automate anyone else out of a job. <laughs> That's never the intention, so. Yeah, I mean, the la I guess the last closing statement just to make is, uh, I mean, especially for the startups out there or, or even the you know, people in academia, I mean, you gotta look for the problems, which again, people say you would've gotta be solving problems, but don't just take the problems from people at an executive level or maybe a managerial level. Talk. Talk to the actual humans who are in the field, who are doing stuff, who are the ones struggling with getting information or struggling with specific things. That's where you really get down to what the core problems are. Uh, because you'll see many organizations you go into, there are so many disconnects on what the real problem is, and trying to align all those things is really one of the most difficult parts uh, you can do. But you learn a lot from, from talking to the people who are, who are really, you know, down there, uh, uh, getting their uh, getting their hands dirty. Fantastic, thank you all. Um, let's go to the other humans in the room. Do we have some questions from the audience? I can't see anything with these lights, so. Hi, I just want to say that your speech is pretty nice, and I have one question to ask. So basically, my question is like, so right now, I am basically initiate on a creative project, which is help those industries to improve their safety standards by using AI. So I just want to ask, like if I want to apply AI to those, like for example, chemical factories or those industries, like chemical industries or those factories, so basically our goal or the objective is to reduce the human error. But actually, I just want to ask, because we all know that building this kind of AI model is computationally expensive. So I just want to ask, like, will this kind of like, uh, expensive computational cost worth it? Like, does it worth? Like, will, like if we build an AI model to effectively learn uh, all kinds of accidents 
happen inside those factories, and we build some kind of intelligent system or some kind of AI automations that can replace human inside those factories, will the accidents and hazards be actually reduced? And will the computational cost to train this kind of model actually worth uh, the reduction of the human error inside this kind of industry? I've got some thoughts, but you're not here to hear from me. You can, you can talk if you want. I, I'm happy to chat about this. Um, so when it comes to things that we do at WestJet, there's always kind of like a cost-benefit analysis that happens. And it would happen in, in the industry you're talking about as well. As there's going to be a cost associated with those errors, and the individual industry will know really, really well how they can measure that cost and what that cost truly is to them. And then we can take that and say, OK, well, if we have this model, this is how much compute it's taking. This is how much cost it takes to run. This is how much cost it takes to monitor. Is that worth it for the business? And we've had projects that get shut down, not because they're not cool, not because they're not helpful, but because the cost-benefit analysis doesn't make sense for the business, right? And that's just the reality of it at the end of the day. It's that we would be spending too much money to automate something that, if we just keep it going the way it is, is not a risk to our guests, is not a risk to our operations, and works good enough right now. So. Yeah, I just want to support to um, Kim's point to say, um, in addition to the cost um, benefit analysis that you do, you also look at the problem at hand. So um, for example, in precision medicine, um, if you have a molecular assay, let's say, detecting an active colon cancer signature, are you basically trying to replace colonoscopy? The answer is potentially no at this point, but maybe with more data you can drive or you can make a case towards replacing colonoscopy. So I think if you look at the problem at hand, how many of these instances are happening, um, what is the actual danger there? Of course, if it's human death, then there's no way you can, you can replace that. Um, what does insurance do about that? So I think it's more in-depth analysis of the business case. Um, and from that, you should be able to get your responses. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add is um, benefit is not just not just money. Uh, yes. Yeah, expand your horizon, and you you didn't say it was just money. Uh, but uh, whenever you're building this business case, expand your horizon, and and you um, you need to take some time to understand um, what could be the benefit. So talk with people. Uh, they're the people who are working in this environment will be the the better uh, the better one to explain to you what's a, what's a, what could be a benefit to them, and also understand as you said, is this a real problem? If not, um, it's going to be a challenge. You'll need to, to convince someone within the company that this is a problem to them, because uh, uh, you need to have a good business case, but also a champion that's going to uh, go through all of the hoops that we have to to go through in in bigger companies to get a yes. All right, I think I saw a few other hands up, if we've got. All right, uh, my question is a little bit different, but I'm wondering how can we get better support systems for under 18 to get interested into AI and STEM and innovation, all that kind of stuff, but also to actually get to the next steps, because I've noticed that there is a lack of support systems, especially for under 18, to go any further, or I guess the next kind of part of that is, have you seen any? Yeah, I volunteer for an organization called uh, Ladies Learning Code and Kids Learning Code and Canada Learning Code. Uh, there's chapters all across Canada, and what they do is put on one-day workshops to help get people interested in technology. And so it could be anything. I've done data science workshops for them before, but I've also helped people build websites, build games, like you name it. So there are different pockets of things like that that exist out there. And then I know from when I was at the university as well, um, and I'm sure other universities have this, we had sessions, like these big conferences effectively, for high school students all across Saskatchewan to come to the U of S and hear about different aspects of computer science. So whether that was AI, whether that was, um, we once had like someone from CSIS, the Canadian Security Institute, come and talk to students. 
those different types of things. So there's lots of kind of those types of events that happen. And then once you get into, say, like a university, then you can really start down that path or even like a technical college of learning those skills if it's not offered by your, your school already. And I will tell you that from my, I didn't learn how to code until after my undergrad. <laughs> and it's not, yeah, right? <laughs> Shock. Um, I didn't even like computers until after my undergrad. So even if you're later on or you didn't have, say, all the opportunities that somebody else did in a bigger center, you can still get into it later on in life. Um, I know Sam, who's in the audience, does a bunch of stuff with Elevate Aviation. It's a great organization. They're also based in Edmonton, and they try to support people getting jobs in the aviation sector, especially people that are from underrepresented in groups. And so she does lots with like the data science side of that in aviation and, and trying to get people in that way as well. So you can talk to her more about that if you'd like. Yeah, and, and some of my experience, I, I have worked with some of the different groups within the, the U of C, the U of A. So I know there's a lot of activity that's kind of happening around this, uh, around this space um, at the university level. When it comes to high school and, and sort of pre-university, I, I don't have as much experience working in that space, but I, I would love to give a plug to Amy. Um, so definitely connect with someone from Amy because they've done an amazing job of sort of understanding the landscape here in Alberta that supports individuals that are interested in this, this field. Uh, as well, um, Edmonton Unlimited and Platform Calgary, I believe both run some programming that, that reaches into uh, the high school uh, system as well. Um, to try to get people encouraged into not just AI, but more into entrepreneurship and sort of technology and innovation in general. <clears throat> I think we maybe have time for one more question, maybe two. Uh, who's got the microphone? Oh. Sorry, um, my, my, I have a question. Um, I want to understand on the issue of um, transparency. Um, you, you spoke about there is, a, there is a need for documentation to be transparent enough. So how do you um, strike the balance between sharing the steps of how a model is built and making sure you're preventing the, the sensitive information from going out? So how do you strike that balance? I feel like that's a big question, so it might be our last, but we'll open it up to the panel. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can start on that one. So um, the idea of transparency is uh, both internal in my mind as well as external. Um, so, of course, there's IP, there's trade secrets within a company, and those, by all means, um, to every level, those should be kept as confidential as possible. Um, but the interpretation of transparency in AI, it's more on the external side. So, for example, the regulators, um, the FDA is going to ask a question. Um, if you tell me that your AI model is a black box, how do you then expect me to regulate that model if I don't know what that model is? Is it a decision tree? Is it a neural network? What are the risks associated to each type of model? Um, so that's the bigger challenge for companies is, is actually establishing the documentation that demonstrates that they are saying what they are actually doing. And so in, in terms of transparency, that's the extent to which it should be. I hate to go technical in these kind of panels, but um, there's an ISO standard called IEC 62304 that basically spells out everything. You, so you need to document all the way to system units. If it's um, how is, uh, for example, bias addressed in, in model training, validation, as well as testing. Um, and uh, what's the software architecture? What is the component of the AI? How is the data pre-processed? So all those things, that's the extent to which um, the documentation needs to be created to establish transparency. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? That was a great answer. Huh? Okay. Maybe we do have time for one more. One more question, one more question. So I got a question for WestJet. <laughs> I know you're no not comment. representing WestJet, but <laughs> how can I trust that when I'm using the chatbot to plan my trip, it's helping me plan my trip and not pushing me products that I don't want? Yeah, so that's our responsibility, right, as the data scientist group. And just to be clear, like this virtual travel agent doesn't exist yet. It was just an idea, a use case for us to kind of get used to those open AI models. And we had that discussion as the team. It's like, hey, how do we make this have the most benefit to our guests? And how do we make it deliver the solution that they would want and not a solution that they wouldn't want, right? Because at the end of the day, we want it to be usable. 
and we would want it to be providing value. If it didn't provide value, and it's like, hey, like my classic example was, I would like to go to a Taylor Swift concert for her heirs tour. I don't care where I go. Tell me how I can get there and where I can stay, and my budget is X. And if it told me, here's a great flight to Spain. You can leave next week or whatever. I'm never, ever going to use that again, right? I'm going to be like, OK, thanks, but no thanks. So it's really up to us to say, OK, how can we push uh, this use case? What, how does it respond? How does it perform? If I was a user of this, would I be happy with this result? And making sure that we're not coding in biases that would prevent it from being useful to our guests, right? Does that answer your question? All right, well, I think that brings us to time here. So if I can ask everybody to join me in, in thanking our, our panelists. Thank you all for being here and hope you have a great rest of the Upper Bound Week.